Well, I want to welcome you to our study in Psalm 68 this, this afternoon. So let me read this, Psalm 68. For the choir director, a psalm of David, a psalm. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered, and let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As, melt, as wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish before God. <clears throat> but let the righteous be glad. Let them exult before God. Yes, let them rejoice with gladness. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is the Lord, and exalt, him, exalt before him. A father to the fatherless, a judge for the widows, is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O God, when thou didst go before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, Selah. The earth quaked. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou didst shed abroad a plentiful rain, O God. Thou didst confirm thy inheritance when it was parched. Thy creatures settled in it. Thou didst provide in, the, in thy goodness for the poor, O God. The Lord gives the command. The women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. Kings of armies flee, they flee, and she who remains at home will divide the spoil. When you lie down among the sheepfolds, you are like the wings of a dove covered with silver, and its pinions with glistening gold. When the Almighty scattered the kings there, it was snowing in Zalman. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan, a mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with envy, O mountain with many peaks, at the mountain which God has desired for his abode? Surely the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captive many thy captives. Thou hast received gifts from among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation. Selah. God is to us a God of deliverances, and to God the Lord belongs escapes from death. Surely God will shatter the head of his enemies, the hairy crown of him who, is, who goes on, his, on in his guilty deeds. The Lord said, I will bring them back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that your foot may shatter them in blood, and the tongue of your dogs may have its portion from your enemies. They have seen thy procession, O God, the procession of my God, my king into the sanctuary. The singers went on, the musicians after them, in the midst of the maidens beating tambourines. Bless God in the congregations, even the Lord, you who are of the fountain of Israel. There is Benjamin, the youngest, ruling them, the princes of Judah in their throng, the princes of Zebulun, the princes of Naphtali. Your God has commanded your strength. Show thyself strong, O God, who has, acted, who has acted on behalf. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring gifts to thee. Rebuke the beasts in the reeds, the, herds, the herd of bulls with the cows, calves of the people, trampling underfoot the pieces of silver. He has scattered the peoples who delight in war. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. Selah. To him who rides on the highest heavens, which are from ancient times, behold, he, spring, he speaks forth with his voice, a mighty voice. Ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel, and his strength is in the skies. O God, thou art awesome from thy sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and power to the people. Blessed be God. And so we see it's a really long psalm there, not near as long as Psalm 119, but it's got a lot of verses and there's a lot of things in here. Is it talking about what God has done in the past or is it prophetic of what God will do in the future? I think to some extent there's some, some both of that in here. As many psalms, as Jesus himself said, there were, there were prophecies throughout the psalms. What did God do for his people Israel as he brought them out of Egypt? He did go before them. He did scatter the enemies. He went before them in a cloud and, and a pillar of fire. He, he, he drove the enemies away. And yet there's going to come a day, I believe, that the Lord will do that again as God himself returns. And he, he, he gathers his people together and there'll be this great 
um, great mighty time of God showing off his power. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. I just think about all what's going on in the world today. How many nations there are, how many peoples there are that are just totally against God. You know, and they, they, don't, they don't love the Lord. There is enemies. They're, they're, the nations are plotting against the Lord. And what, what do we cry out when we see things going on in the world today? I mean, there's war in Israel and bombing back and forth between Iran and them and stuff going on in our own country. I think there's this desire that wells up in our heart that we would say, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. God, just come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let's take, just take care of what's going on in this world. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And he will in his time. He's not, he's not like at our beck and call to do what we want him to do. He's gonna do what he wants to do in his own time. But David says this, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him like smoke that's driven away, like, like fire melting wax. Let them just disappear. They're just removed. And God can do that. Let the wicked perish before God. This is David's prayer. Think about all the, th the things that we pray for. We usually pray for good things. You know, we want health. We want finances. We want good relationships. We want healing. And David here is praying that God's enemies would melt like wax. It's pretty stiff. <laughs> You know, I think, it's a, I think it's a legitimate prayer that we can pray, God, remove the enemies, just tear them apart, burn them down, just, just take care of them because God can do that. Not that we desire the death of the wicked, but we want the enemies of God removed. And David says here, let the righteous be glad. Why would they be glad? Because God is driving away his enemies. God is melting his enemies like wax. He's taking care of all those people. Yes, let them exult before God. Let them rejoice with gladness. What did the children of Israel do when they crossed the Red Sea and saw the bodies of the Egyptians floating in the water? They sang, they danced, they had a party. They rejoiced that God delivered them from the people who oppressed them. Does that sound mean? Well, we would rejoice if our enemies were crushed. We would rejoice that God saved us. And so I don't think this is an illegitimate prayer request or something that we shouldn't rejoice that God does this. So we sing praises to God. We're singing, lifting up songs to him. And, and David's looking back here, lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts. The children of Israel were going out into the desert. They went from Egypt. They crossed the, the Sinai Peninsula, crossed the Gulf of Aqaba into, into, uh, into what was modern day Saudi Arabia. It's a desert. They went into the desert. Where was God at? In the desert. That's where Moses met him on Mount Sinai. They can go there even today. There's a burnt top on top of the mountain. There's petroglyphs all around. There's evidence that they were there. One of the things I think is interesting here is later on, he says he pours out rain in that parched land and makes it green, basically. He's, he's filling up that desert with rain. And you know one reason why a desert's a desert because it doesn't get a lot of rain. And you even see a lot of, a lot of situations when a desert gets some rain, plants will start growing up out of it. Uh, and it's just kind of neat, you know, it's the weather cycle that God controls. So even in the middle of the Sahara Desert, if God put enough rain in there, there'd be plants growing. Where are the seed, where has the seed been? It's been sitting in the ground for, for a long time. And so God can do that. So he's saying, you know, let's praise the Lord. Let's exalt his name. And God is a father of the fatherless, a judge of the widows. God is, God is that in his holy habitation. I think this is why James says, that true and undefiled religion is this, that we take care of widows and orphans in their distress, that we take care of those who can't take care of themselves. That's what we need to be doing as, as when we're reaching out to people. That's what God cares about. Does God care about everybody? Absolutely. But he definitely cares about those without fathers and those who have no husbands, you know, the widows in their distress, the people who don't, don't have someone to take care of them. That's what he's, he's, he's concerned about. And because of that, Verse six says, God makes a home for the lonely. So if a person's lonely, the Lord can make a home for them and the Lord's going to take care of them. God's gonna, God's gonna care for them in his home. He makes a home for the lonely. He leads the prisoners out into prosperity. Only the rebellious will dwell on a parched land. Only the rebellious dwell there. Why, why are they in the parched land? It's because they refuse to be where God is because where God is, there's plenty. God takes care of them. Even if it's in the middle of a desert, God can make that desert bloom. And for those people who reject him, the rebellious ones, he's going to make even the green land that they're in, I believe, into a parched land because he can do that. And he's going to provide for those that he leads out 
O oh God, when you did go, for, go before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earthquake, the heavens dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You did shed abroad a plentiful rain. You did confirm your inheritance when it was parched. Creatures settled in it. God brought all sorts of animals and God provided for the goodness of the poor. We think, you know, the children of Israel wandered around in the middle of the wilderness for 40 years and that was sad, it really was. But God provided everything they needed. Not only that, but God provided for all their <clears throat> livestock. And so where the children of Israel could eat the manna from heaven, I think God provided grass for the, for the animals in the middle of a desert. <laughs> you know? So God's making all those things grow. And here these people are wandering around in the middle of the desert for 40 years, and God's providing for everything they need. He did that in the past. Well, think about what he'll do in the future when, you know, a lot of people have a, different ideas on how this world's going to end, but, but when the Lord returns, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of uh, enemies that are crushed, a lot of death, a lot of disturbances, and even in the middle of that, we were talking about uh, prepping earlier, you know, you can prep all you want to, but there might come a day when all those things that you prepared are gone. And then where, where are you relying on? You're relying on God. And really, if we rely on God for all of our needs every single day, that's better anyways. Because he can take care of us. He has the ability to give us everything we need. Should we prepare? Absolutely. But it might be that the Lord removes us from what we've carefully prepared for ourselves to a place where we've got nothing. And the only thing we've got left is him, and he is more than capable to provide what we need. Not only that, he's able to surround us with everything else. God gives the command. The women who proclaim good tidings are a great host. This is a party. There's, there's a great party. People are dancing. Everybody's having a good time. They're shouting out praise to the Lord. The kings of armies flee. She who remains at home will divide the spoil. I mean, they've been beaten by women. <laughs> I mean, that's basically the way it's saying it, but God causes the kings to flee and everyone who's just hanging around, they go and spoil what's left. God's provided it even in that. When you lie down among the sheepfold, you're like the wings of a dove covered with silver, its pinions glistening with gold. There's a protective protectiveness in God's sheepfold that God provides everything that we need when we're with him. And that's what he did for the children of Israel in the desert. I think that's what he'll do. As we looked in the book of Revelation, that's what he'll do for the remnant of Israel in the wilderness when he, when he draws them out. And he can also do that for us when we desperately need him. He'll provide everything we need. God scatters the kings. When, God, when the Almighty scattered the kings there, it was snowing in Zalman. Zalman, Bashan, all of those areas are on the, west, are on the east side of the Jordan River. All of Israel's enemies that were on the east side, Moab, Ammon, and on up into the highlands there, they didn't want the children of Israel coming into their land because they thought that they were going to take their land. They, the children of Israel just wanted to pass through, but they opposed him. Moab opposed God, and so God says, well, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to destroy you. Uh, and we know that you know, the, the country Jordan uh, today, Ammon is its capital city. It's called Ammon, Jordan, because it's from Ammon, the son of Lot, from one of his daughters. <laughs> you know, ben Ami was his name. And so that, that group of people have been against God's people for a very long time. When the Lord conquered them, when the Lord scattered them, it was snowing on those mountains. And those mountains, the people there were looking with jealousy on God's people. Why, and he asked the question, why are you jealous? Why do you desire this mountain which God desired for his boat? God, the Lord will live there forever. Where the kings could have many uh, chariots, and God scattered those. Verse 17 says, the chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. And we know when the children of Israel came out of, out of Egypt, there were 600,000 some men within a certain age range. So there's probably two, three, four, five million people among the children of Israel that came out of Egypt. It was a vast host of people. And that at least that many people survived through the wilderness, the next generation. And they came with a huge number of people across that land going into the promised land. God was with them. God was surrounding them. But I think David may even be indicating something else here. He might even be referring to the return of Christ when the Lord comes on his white horse and he's surrounded by the myriads upon myriads. That verse shows up in Revelation. In the throne room of God, 
God is surrounded by myriads of myriads of angels. He's surrounded by a heavenly army that's more vast and more powerful than any human army ever was. That's how God is. We think, you know, when Jesus came, he came as a lowly little baby in a manger and he shed his, his uh, um, he was always God. He just removed his majesty and glory for a brief time. And when people looked at Jesus, they didn't see anything, anything different. They just said, there he is, just like anybody else. But when Jesus returns a second time, it's gonna be a completely different thing. Jesus will come in all of his great power and all of his great glory and all of his armies with him. Does he need the host of angels with him? No, he doesn't because he's magnificent in and of himself, but he will come with his whole entourage and all of his power and all of his glory and he will consume the kings and drive them away and scatter them. That's what he did. And then this verse 18, you have ascended on high, led captive thy captives and received gifts among men. Paul talks about this in the book of Romans. He talks about this in several places in the New Testament where he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He's referring to Jesus. Jesus went down into the lower parts of the earth and then he ascended up on high and he led captivity captive. He set people free. That's what God does when he comes is he sets people free who are trusting in him. And so David is looking back at how God had done that and he's looking forward to how God will do that in the future through Christ and in his first and in his second coming. Do you, have you ever read verse 19 now and really thought about it? Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burdens. Do you have a burden that you bear on a daily basis? We all do, right? And Jesus said, pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread, right? So we're asking, God, will you provide for us today? The children of Israel were in the wilderness. What did they have to do? All they had to do was walk outside and scoop up the manna, right? Just enough for today. Don't try to get greedy because if you try to keep it for tomorrow, it's gonna be all wormy, right? It's gonna be, be maggots, except for one day a week. You can, you can keep it the, on the, before the Sabbath day. But every, every other day, God's like, you don't need this super abundance to save up for the future because I'm providing for you what you need right now. You don't need everything else. I'm gonna give you what you need right now. And I know in our world, we wanna have you know, huge bank accounts and all this. Kind of, I'm not saying don't be prepared. I'm just saying all that can go in an instant and be gone. What we really need is God to provide every moment of every single day. So what if you did save up a million dollars for your nest egg in your, in your retirement? Do you know how many people hit retirement, and then spend that money in less than a year because of health problems? It happens. Does that mean you shouldn't? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying trust God. God made the children of Israel healthy all the way through the wilderness. He made it so their clothes didn't wear out. The shoes on their feet didn't wear out. I mean, what's the longest lasting pair of shoes that you've had, you know, that you wear every single day? They don't last that long. You might get a year or two out of them, but eventually you're gonna to have to throw it away and get a new one. What if God made it so none of that wore out? Well, that's what the Lord was doing for the children of Israel in the wilderness. You think he can't do it today? And I know he can. He can, he can give us everything that we ever need. And when we have the Lord, we're so much far better off. We're, we're more blessed. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden. God, the God who is our salvation. God is to us a God of deliverances. To God the Lord belongs escapes from death. He, God will surely shatter the head of his enemies. David knew this from personal experience, right? David's out in the wilderness. What's God doing? Delivering David. David goes on one, one side of the mountain. Saul goes on the other side of the mountain. God delivered him. David goes and hides in a cave. Saul walks right by. God delivered him. <laughs> you know, so time after time, David was, was seeing God deliver him. If God can deliver David, can he not deliver us if we're trusting him? I'm just putting that out there. We can trust him. He is literally our salvation eternally, but he also delivers us on a moment-by-moment -moment basis if we're walking with him and trusting in him. I, I believe he can do that right there. So David says, God will shatter the head of his enemies. He'll destroy them. He'll bring them back from Bashan, his enemies. The enemies of Bashan, these people came through and, and did destroy a lot of Israel, and they would even after David's day. 
he'll bring them back from the depths of the sea. So he's going to bring all of his people back from all over the world. That's been prophesied already. And they're going to watch what God does. Even their dogs. I've seen this question um, somewhere this week. People were asking, you know, will we have our, our pet animals in heaven? And my standard answer has been, no, not really. <laughs> I mean, there's, no, there's nothing proven in the scripture that you'll have your pet, your favorite pet will be in heaven. Because we know that, you know, even in the book of Revelation, the dogs are outside the city. Does that mean there's actual dogs there? Maybe. I mean, if God put animals here, can he put animals in eternity? If he wanted to do that? Well, what purpose would the dogs that he mentions here have in this time frame? Well, the tongue of the dogs would have their portion among their enemies. What happened to Jezebel? Got pushed out the window by a eunuch, right? And according to the prophecy by Jehu, I believe it was, it might have been Elisha, probably both of them, she fell to her death and the dogs ate her up before someone could come get her body and bury her. Now, that's pretty cruel. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's rough, man. You know, she didn't even get a burial, probably didn't deserve one, but the, the wild animals took care of that. The wild animals took care of that. So God provides even for them in that. They have seen your procession, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. Think about what it would have been like to, look, to watch from afar as the children of Israel carried the Ark of the Covenant in front of them through from Sinai, through Moab, through Ammon, through all of these places, and then ended up at the Jordan River. So you're up on a hill and you're watching this because you can't actually watch it from a hill. You're off in the distance and you see this great multitude of people and it's a lot of noise and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And all of a sudden, the river stops. Because <laughs> you know somebody had to see that happen. Like somebody was probably watching that from a distance going, uh-oh, <laughs> we gotta do something about this. Not that we can do anything at this point. And this magnificent group of, like, huge group of people just coming across. And then they come across. The last regular makes it through. And then the river just comes crashing down on top of itself. What will it be like when Jesus steps foot on the Mount Sinai with all of his people with him? With all of his angels with him? And he's coming as king, this magnificent train of people coming to the sanctuary. The, what's the biggest parade you've ever seen? The longest parade you've ever seen. Well, I believe that the Lord will have a parade that day that will. Un I think that that would be a, one of the best worship services that you'd ever want to be a part of. Does that mean that we need to go get some tambourines and add to the worship service? Well, hey, if you want to do that, I ain't got no problem with it. <laughs> of course, I've been some places where it gets really excited and people start passing them around, you know. Uh, but but there's this aspect of the joy that comes with it because you're so excited. You're with God. And it's the best day ever. Think about how beautiful today is. And if Jesus showed up, how much better it would be. I mean, when the Lord comes in his great glory and people are worshiping, what a blessed day that is. And he's, David's looking, you know, it's Benjamin, the princes of Judah, got all these princes with him. And God is showing himself in his strength and they're coming to the temple and the kings are bringing gifts to God. And it's just Everybody running to where God is and saying, I, I want to bring you gifts. Jesus is in his holy temple. God's in his temple. And you have kings from all over the place. Ethiopia, Egypt, everywhere else. Kings from all over bringing their, their, their gifts to the Lord. And they sing. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to God. To him who rides upon the highest heaven, which are from ancient times. When Jesus returns, he will ride the clouds of heaven and he will come in his power and glory. In the Old Testament, God rode the powers, God rode the clouds of heaven. There, were, there was a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. To him who rides the highest heaven, which are from ancient time, behold, he speaks forth with his voice, a mighty voice. And when God speaks forth in that day, it will be a mighty voice, and there will be great praise from those who love him, and there'll be great mourning from those who have resisted him. What does David say? Ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel. His strength is in the skies. O God, you are awesome from your sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and power to the people. When Jesus comes, when God comes, it's not that he's just going to show off his own power. He will. There's no doubt about it. But what else is he going to do? 
His presence will give strength and power to the people as they bless God. I'm looking forward to that day. I think David was looking forward to that day. He wanted the, the, the Lord to fill his people. And he's, even as David was looking forward to a temple that was not yet built, preparing for it, that Solomon would, would build this. Some of this was fulfilled partially in that. When Solomon built the temple, who came? Well, the queen of Sheba came. There were, there were kings and queens from all over the world who came to meet Solomon. That's partial fulfillment. They were worshiping the Lord and that got to know who God was. And then they would leave and go back home. But the day is coming when all the earth will see the Lord in his holy temple and they will see him in his great power and it, they will bless the Lord in that.